Okay, thank you for coming back after the break. We are going to prepare for our last speaker, and after that we'll have uh, uh, an interactive discussion. So if you want to stick around for that, we'll have lots of time for questions for all of the speakers um, after Alejandro's talk. So I'd like to introduce uh, Alejandro Rojas, and he's going to be talking to us about Oomycete community diversity in the soybean root rot complex. And he's from Michigan State University. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. And also I want to thank the APS Travel Foundation to uh, give me the funds to come to the meeting. So today I'm going to talk about um, something that is early, I mean in the early stages that we are doing. What I mean is that we are trying to analyze a specific part of the microbiome. And today we are going to talk about the all my seed community diversity and what we are doing at Michigan State. So I just want to start with a, a classic diagram that we have here. We know that there is a lot of propagules present in the soil. There is a community that is present and can interact with the other organisms present in the soil and also with the plants. And there are different conditions that can affect the microbi microbiome present uh, in these conditions. And in our case, in agriculture, we have different factors that affect this community. We have different varieties or germ germplasm we have crop rotation, we have seed treatment, cover crops, and tillage. All of them can cause different effects on the community. So here in the diagram, we have a little uh, representation of what I think is happening in the community. And this is something that has been discussed for mycorrhizae. So we have a small pool of propagules that, is present, that are present in the soil. And then we have the first filter, the abiotic conditions. This can be draw, precipitation, temperature, all the things that you can think that are abi abiotic and can filter the community. And then we have the host filter, and as you saw in the previous talk, in, especially in Saras, you can see that the plants themselves have a lot of uh, effect on the community, and they can filter this community even more. Then we have a small pool, and it's just uh, specifically in this case to the organisms, how good they are interacted with others organisms and we will have weak competitors that can coexist and have an, a bigger pool or we can have really strong competitors that are going to reduce other microorganisms and they are going to colonize the plant and again we as plant pathologists we know that there are usual suspects associated with plant phenotypes but we know also and we didn't have the tools until recently to study how communities are affecting these phenotypes. And that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to analyze the omicid community and how the different uh, species interact together to cause the different common phenotypes that we uh, have in the field, in our case, in the soybean field. So there have been a lot of different studies, but there is a still limited knowledge on the diversity, composition, and abundance of these species. Also. As many of, of you know, there are really important omicid species in different ecosystems. We have the agricultural and the natural ecosystems. And I don't have to give a lot of examples, but we have southern oak dead and the lay blight as really good example, examples in the different ecosystem, ecosystems. And they have an important role in the community. I, as I mentioned before, we have classic studies that use culture-based approach to study some of these communities and how uh, diverse are these organisms in the different environments. They use some of the barcodes that we already have, and they were published, like the cytochrome oxidase and the ITS. So in the omicid community, we have a, a good start. We have all the sequences that are available. But when we are coming to these new approaches, like the metagenomics, we don't have a good representation. And this is just an example. This is a chronograph. It's almost like a pie chart with different levels. But as you can see here in the red square, are the omicids represented in a metagenomic study? That means that they sequence all the DNA that they isolated from soil. And 0.01% of that community is just omicid. And probably you won't read it, but in the center, the level that these organisms are classified is actually unclassified. So that is another important point that I want to remark in my talk. We need databases. We need something 
that we can use and uh, construct something better to approach these communities. So since all my seeds are underrepresented in these environments, we need to use a different approach. And this, this is the approach that can be used for other um, microorganisms uh, and is the amplicon-based community analysis. I, I'm going to use the fungi as, a, uh, fungi as an example because uh, you already saw how bacteria community analysis is well developed. It has come a long way. Fungi are halfway through and all my seeds is really early. But in the case of fungi, they establish an uh, uh, ITS as the fungal barcode uh, to characterize the different species. They have a joint community effort, and they have different databases. For example, the UNITE example that Philippe presented earlier is one of the most well-developed databases for fungi. It has a really good taxonomy, and it's what the community is using, and that is really important. There is a new effort from the NCBI. It's pretty recent. They are trying to build a reference sequence database for fungi, but that is another example. And here on the lower part, I have a benchmark that RDP from Michigan State uh, uh, did comparing different databases because that is another key part when you are doing these kind of studies. You can have different databases and you are going to have different answers. So in this case, they are comparing different data sets and all of them that have different, com well, they have common sequences and common uh, taxes represented by those sequences. But you can see there are, there are also a lot of unique organisms in those databases. So again, it is really important to have something established for the homicides. And that's uh, what I want to promote in this talk. So there are different uh, leaders in the homicide community working on the homicide phylogenetics and definition of species. We had this uh, paper by Robido that set a really good stage to uh, build up all the microbial or OMIC community analysis. They established the ITS and the cytochrome oxidase as the best markers to characterize whole OMIC communities. They also the, uh, have the data available in the uh, CBOL database, the consortium of uh, barcode life database, or maybe I misspelled that. But again, this is just a starting place for us to study the OMIC community. But a taxonomy is really important. We don't have, a, or it's really hard to have a species definition. So the way that you compare your sequences is going to be key to get your answers. And this is also uh, another uh, part of work from different people. And Andre Levesque and Arthur de Koch, they have established different phylogenetic studies separating all the clades for pitium. And this is the point that I use to establish my studies. In the case of Phytophthora, we have the recent paper from Frank Martin and Jamie Miller that also re-evaluated the Phytophthora phyl phylogeny and um, gave us more information that we can use. But again, this is a, a joint community effort that we have to push forward to get the results and have a con something consolidated across the community so we can compare the studies and have more information about these communities. Um, the last paper, Hyde uh, et al. in 2014, is a recent paper that pulled together all these different leaders in the different taxonomic groups, and they are trying to create a database for the different fungal and omicid groups, um, showing the best mark codes that you can use to identify the different species. So in our specific case, we are part of a big project funded by USDA and NIFA. This is the omicid soybean cap project. And what we were trying to do is sample all the soybean producing area in the Midwest, and these are the different locations that we sample, to understand what is the diversity of all my seeds associated to root rot diseases in soybean, uh, especially seedlings. Our questions were, what are the species that are present there? Are there pathogen complexes that are, we can associate with the different um, locations? And what factors are driving the community diversity? So when we started this project, we set up like a workflow that we are trying to uh, follow to build information that we can use for different approaches. So all the survey was a culture-based approach. So we started from the classic, and we are built, or we have an organism collection that was um, um, classified using the DNA bar barcodes that I mentioned before. And we are working in the phenotypic data because we need different layers of information to understand 
the role of the different species present in the community. So we are working in, or we work in pathogenicity, we are working in fungicide sensitivity, and other things like growth rates and, and the niche conditions. And these are actually metadata that we are recovering from the different locations. And you can see the different parameters that we are measuring. And the idea is to use that information to input uh, that data into the microbiome studies to understand, again, the role of these different species. Here is the summary of all these, uh, the different clades that we recovered. In total, we recovered 3,500 isolates, 2,400 in 2011, and 1,100 in 2012. In total, we recovered 82 different species. Uh, we sampled symptomatic seedlings. And in this graph, uh, you can see the relative abundance in the x-axis and the different locations on the y-axis. And here in the, in the legend, you can correlate uh, the different colors from the top to the bottom in the graph from the left to the right. So you can see that there is not like presence, absence of the different groups. Most of the differences are in the relative abundance of the different um, clades that we recover. So this is key for part of the study, and you will see why. So looking at the community structure, when we use this information of the relative abundance, we try to see how the different states co correlate with each, with each other. And we have this cluster dendrogram, and as you can see here, for example, Michigan and Illinois are clustering together because they have similar communities. So those states, states that are close by, they, are, they have more similar communities. We also try to look different uh, diversity index and try to correlate with other factors. And this is the second graph that we have on the right side. So we have uh, cows index and we have latitude in the x-axis. And you can see that there is a trend where higher latitudes have less diversity than lower latitudes. So that is part of the community structure that we are trying to analyze. And you can see here on the lower corner the significance for these two analyses. But when we are trying to do a principal coordinate analysis, as you saw before in the other talks, we don't, we don't get a strong clustering of the different communities. This might be due to the sampling effort that we have, but despite that, we are trying to see what factors are driving this lack of clustering or how the community is being um, assembled in the different locations. So what we did here, again, we have a principal coordinate analysis, and then we plot uh, environmental data on top of that to see what are the main factors that are causing this lack of pattern. Um, so to highlight some of them, I'm going to show you some correlations on the seasonal temperature, precipitation, and latitude and pH. So you see here, uh, we took some of the uh, different axes of the principal coordinate analysis and graph against the different uh, factors. For seasonal temperature and precipitation, what we mean by that is that we recover the data for the planting season. So that will go from April to June and extract all the data for temperature and precipitation in those months. And as you can see, we have mostly negative correlations on the diversity or the community structure in relation to these uh, different factors. Another thing that I want to remark is that 2011 and 2012 had different temperature profiles. And as you can see here in these uh, graphs on the left side, you can see bands of temperature across the different uh, states in the Midwest. So these different uh, conditions are causing that different species are under or overrepresented in some of the regions. But again, most of the uh, different clades that we analyze are present across the different states. But that is on the side of the community structure, but we also wanted to develop more uh, phenotypic data so we can correlate this information. And we use two different assays. Uh, we have a seed rod assay and a seedling root rod. The idea with the seed rod is that we put the seeds, uh, we grow the isolate first, sorry, and then after some days, we put the, isolate, uh, the seeds uh, um, to be challenged by the isolate. And what we want to see is colonization of the seed or no uh, effect. And in the ceiling root rod experiment, what we have is an inoculum separated from the actual, uh, from the seeds. So we give some uh, to the seeds some time to germinate and actually be challenged by the different pathogens. So we can get two different phenotypes at the seed and at the ceiling level to see how these uh, different species are aggressive or not. This is just uh, 
an overview of all the results that we got for the different species. We also tested two different temperatures, uh, 20 degrees, which is one of our highest temperatures in the temperature profile, and 13 degrees, which is the rec minimum recommended temperature for planting in, uh, for soybeans. Two special cases are highlighted here in the red and blue box. Those are species that shift their pathogenicity based on the temperature conditions. So in the red one, we have some of the species that have a higher aggra aggressiveness at uh, warmer temperatures, but we also have some cases here in the cold temperatures. So for example, we have Pitino papillum, which, which is one of the second, uh, was the second most abundant species in 2011, and is, uh, it really likes the cold weather and it becomes more aggressive on the sea. And again, um, I forgot to mention, we have a y-axis uh, disease severity index, so 100% is highly pathogenic. And you can relate the different values to the pictures on top. The second experiment, the cylinder rod, uh, we measure different things, but today I'm going just to present the uh, mean weight per root. So lower values are highly diseased plants, like here in the picture, and higher values are really healthy and nice ceilings. And in the green, lighter green box, you can see the control, and in the dark green, you can see some of the highly pathogenic species. So you can see that there are different degrees of pathogenicity, but there is a big break in some of the species that become really pathogenic at the ceiling level. So again, we have a lot of different phenotypes present in the community that we recover from these soybean fields. And this is the information that we are building up. So the idea is to have some sort of matrix that we have all the different uh, phenotypes that we are observing across the different species. So here we have the example for Pitino papillum, the second most abundant isolate in 2011, because of the dry weather in 2012, the abundance of this species dropped uh, quite much. And we have Pitium sylvaticum, that was the most abundant uh, species across the two years. And Phytophthora soya, you, as you know, one of the most important pathogens in soybean. So as you can see here, in the 20 degrees and 13 degrees in the seed rod uh, assay, you can see different phenotypes. So you can see on the, uh, this side, the Pitino papillum becomes more aggressive colonizing more seed. Pitium sylvaticum, it barely have difference between the two different uh, conditions. And in Phytophthora soji, I just want to mention that these plates look really similar to the control. Um, you can also see some delay on germination, and that is due to the temperature. So probably that's one of the issues that we have in the field with the early planting. But Phytophthora soja is not causing mo much disease on the seed. Here on the right side, or yeah, right side, we have that Pitino papillum is not an, a really aggressive pathogen on the ceiling. We have Pitium sylvaticum that is still an aggressive pathogen on ceilings, and Phytophthora soja that was not a really good pathogen at the seed level it is at the ceiling level. Now we are working, or actually uh, SAC, uh, also from the Chilbert lab, is working on characterizing the sensitivity of these different species that we recovered uh, to different chemistries. So here are just presenting some of his data on um, methanoxan, and I forgot the label, but it is methanoxan at 10 parts per million. So here on the y-axis, we have relative growth to the control, and as you can see, most of the species are below the 50% uh, relative growth, uh, yeah, 50% relative growth to the control. But you can see different responses, uh, responses across the different species. So please go today to, he, to Sachs Poster 272, talk to him because he's developing a nice high throughput essay to evaluate the different species that we have and also evaluate different chemistries to see how the community responds to the, these different conditions. So going back to the workflow, we are collecting, or we collected all this data, and this is the data that we can use to analyze the role of the different uh, species present in the community. And we are, we develop, or we try to use some of the uh, different barcodes to do an amplicon-based study. What we did is we designed a specific primers for the cytochrome oxidase, the 20AS, and we used some of the established primers for ITS and tried to engineer to increase the specificity to all my seeds. And in this specific case, we collaborated with Dr. John Roop to test these markers in an experimental setup to study the effect of uh, 
different rotation systems. So we have a continuous soybean system and a rice soybean rotation system to see how that, uh, that is affecting the community composition and also take advantage of this experiment setup to evaluate the performance of our markers. The idea is that we have three, uh, three different sites that have the same treatment, the soybean continuous and the rice soybean rotation, and we recover soil from these different sites and we brought back the soil to the lab, or actually Dr. John Roop in his, in his lab, uh, took the soil into grow chambers, set up two different temperatures, and we use a seed baiting approach to recover all the different species and enrich for all my seeds. And we did, uh, again, a culture-based approach and an amplicon-based uh, approach. This is just some of the results that we got with the amplicon-based uh, approach. So as you can see here, uh, these are just refraction plots. So we have in the y-axis different OTUs, and in the x-axis uh, the sequences per sample. So you can see that 20 AS and cytochrome oxidase have similar behaviors across the different samples, and we are saturating the community. So we are recovering what is uh, most of the species that are supposed to be present in the sample. We have a different uh, result on the ITS locus, and one of the reasons that we have these different results is because we are getting uh, some different, re um, different species. So these are similar to the graph that I mentioned before, but uh, in this case, relative abundance is on the y-axis, and we have the two different treatments. And again, the legend uh, relates from the bottom to the top uh, on the graph. So we have this yellow fraction of the, the community, and everything is summarized by clade when it's possible. So this yellow fraction is other. And when you look at the sequences, what we are getting is a lot of fungal sequences. It's ITS, it's very likely to get some fungal sequences. So we try to um, modify the primers, but at the same time, there was a paper published uh, by Nicolaisen, and they uh, managed to increase the temperature and reduce the amplification of fungal sequences. So we are using the same approach for different experiments that we have going on. Uh, one of the things that I want to mention with ITS is that it's really good in uh, an informative marker, but it has issues, it's land variable, and it's not the best marker for phylogenetic inference. So if your uh, objective is to look for new species and try to use phylogenetics, it's not the best approach that you can use. And again, the issues with other organisms. But in the case of the cytochrome oxidase and the 20 AS, we have similar graphs to the one before, but you can see here in the lower part that pitium clay F and clay B are the most abundant uh, clays that we recover. And we have the same results in both uh, loci. So this is really exciting. We are getting similar results with different markers. Uh, there are some differences in the underrepresented uh, uh, clays, but again, we are getting really good results on this uh, approach. And the good thing with these markers is that these can be used for phylogenetic inference. They are easy to align, and we can uh, use them for different phylogenetic inferences. When we take the cytochrome oxidase and the 20 AS and compare the data with the culture-based approach that we did for this experiment, everything correlates quite nicely. I mean, again, we had clay F and clay B as the most represented uh, uh, clades in both approaches. And we also get some correlation with the ITS data. But again, we have that section of fungal sequences that um, are um, changing some of the results. But again, we are trying to remove those sequences and have um, that result improve. Um, so it is a pretty exciting time to try to study the OMICID uh, community. And Using this information, we were able to parse some of the uh, results that we are getting from this rotation system. So these are principal coordinate analysis, and the main point here that you can see is that there are a strong signal from location, and that is expected because uh, each site will have different conditions with different soil types, uh, different weather. So you can see correlation, or not correlation, but similar results across the three different loci where the clustering is ba mainly based on the uh, location. But here in the 20 AS and the cytochrome oxidase, you can see that in blue we have the soybean continuous system, and in red we have the rice soybean uh, rotation system. And you can see some differences. You can see separation, and these are significant. So rotation systems are causing that the community diversity uh, gets a higher diversity. So we have 
the effect that we expect when we propose our rotation systems, but again, we have a lot of things going on in the community, and hopefully with this approach that we are trying to develop, and many groups are also working on something similar, we can parse out some of these factors that are driving the Omicid community diversity. And this is just a summary slide of all the um, things that we have in mind. So right now, as I mentioned before, it's an exciting time because we can just take plant tissue. We can use, again, culture-based approach or soil to study the propagal that is present in the, in the, in, in the different uh, tissues. But we are also uh, getting the different abundance of the different taxonomic clades. And we have this information that we are building together to analyze the role of the different communities. Hopefully, when more genomes come available, now that we have the Phytophthora Genome Consortium, and hopefully we'll have something similar for Pythium, we can get more genomic information and move on on what they are doing in bacteria, meta transcriptomics, metabolomics, and, and really understand what is the role of the different omicid species, uh, how they interact with, with each other, and how they produce the different phenotypes. So with that, again, I want to emphasize that databases, metadata, and the organisms themselves, the cultures, are key to study these community interactions. Uh, we saw the example with Philippe, going back to the culture is necessary. We can use the Mamplicon information to try to capture some of those underrepresented species, but we can also use cultures to use the classical microecology experiments to try to understand what is happening when we have multiple species interacting together so we can understand what is happening in the field. Again, joint community effort, that is key to have similar results across the community and the development, development of different markers and databases. Uh, phenotypes, I have emphasized a lot what they are useful for. And again, we are trying to analyze different experimental setups to evaluate what is driving the community diversity. So we are trying to look at co-occurrence of a species, even with fungi. We are looking at the polar variation of all my seed species, because in our case, soybean, usually pathion is the one that arrives first to the crop, but then Phytophthora surgery comes later. So we want to see how that correlates with the amplicon data. And again, interactions, community assembly. We want to understand how these uh, different species form complexes to either cause or not disease. With that, I want to acknowledge all our uh, collaborators that help us during the sampling, uh, the Children's Lab members, Dr. Frank Martin, for all the great feedback, and all the uh, funding agencies for these projects. Uh, with that, I will take any questions. Can you repeat the last part? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I will think that they are, and that's something that we are trying to parse out. So we are, uh, we have an another experiment setting up different species and see how they correlate on the output that is disease. Uh, in the specific case of Pythium, they are pretty aggressive. There are different species that can cause disease. I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. But the question is, are these different species uh, can replace each other and cause the same phenotype? It is very likely in the Pythium. Uh, Phytophthora soji is, uh, is very unique in this sense, and is one of the only Phytophthora that are affecting soybean. But we also found a new Phytophthora, Phytophthora sansomiana. And, um, in the specific case of those two phytophthora, they have different um, um, if effects on the disease output. So phytophthora soji is quite uh, later on the season, and the symptoms are quite um, different from the 
uh, Phytophthora sansomiana, where the Phytophthora sansomiana is more of a root rot pathogen and is um, a root nibbler, if you may. But in the pathogen, we will have a species that will replace and cause the same effects. I don't know if you, that answers your question. Well, we were using soybean seeds, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that these are uh, seeds that are, um, don't have any source of resistance. Um, well, what we did is pretty much a control um, sort of mesocosms. Um, so we had the seeds in contact with the soil, and we were uh, taking the seeds after 48 hours, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, that was something that we did to enrich the community because I mean, they are underrepresented, they are there, but just to test the markers, this is, this, uh, we were lucky that Dr. John Roop had this approach and we can actually test what is going on in the community. But we have other experiments that are looking at uh, bulk soil, actual roots, to see what we recover from the actual field. The question is, do we try to use different seed sources to evaluate the different uh, outcomes of the different species in terms of disease? Uh, for this, I uh, part of the experiment, because it's a huge representation of the community, we use a Sloan that is known to be really susceptible to most of the homicides. It doesn't have any resistance for Phytophthora. We don't have any resistance available for Pythium. So we try to pick something that didn't have any homicide-related resistance. Um, we didn't do it for that experiment. We have something in the field that we are trying two different cultivars of soybean and trying to see how that affects um, inoculated community uh, and see what is the outcome of those species. I think that, yeah, it can be a yeah, generalist. I mean, it depends where you look, <laughs> I will say. But it is one of the fast growers, and also that depends on the group. But what I think is that we have different sources of variability. I mean, you saw it in the phenotypic data. Uh, hopefully, we will get some growth data to prove how these different species uh, compete with each other. That will be great. But so far, and that's the common knowledge, I will say that it is a generalist. But probably some people just regard Pythium because of that. But actually, it's a really cool pathogen. So I mean, there is a lot of diversity of Pythium, too, as you saw it. OK, please join me in thanking Alejandro for a great talk. So I have one announcement, um, if you just joined us. Our final speaker was unable to make it due to some visa problems. He's still waiting for his visa, so he will not be joining us. Um, so we're going to open it up for an interactive discussion, and if we could invite the speakers to come up, and if anybody has any follow-up questions for them, um, you can take this time to ask them. And if you are on our live stream, you can tweet your questions in at hashtag APS15 if you have any. And I think we do have
Do you want to read it? It's like, I guess I'll read it. Um, so there was one question that came in through Twitter for Alejandro uh, regarding um, the seed variety, soil type, moisture and nutrient input affect umycete communities? Um, so, uh, regarding that question, this is something that we try to emphasize when we were doing the sampling. We have too many collaborators and they were trying to do the best job that they can. Sometimes we are uh, trying to sample different fields from growers and not that all information is available. However, we were lucky and we were using GPS data to recover most of the information using uh, uh, different uh, databases. So that is the information that you saw plotted in the, um, in the graph. For uh, cultivar, again, that depends on the grower and sometimes that information gets uh, lost in the process. So again, if you are working in these kind of uh, projects, please try to do the best to collect all the information. I know it's really hard, but it will be really important down the road to do all these analysis and compare the different studies. So I'll just repeat the question for the, the live streaming audience. So Linda Kinkle was asking the question basically about how do we deal with spatial scale. Anyone? I like it <laughs> you got it. Scale is important. Spatial scale is important. Um, so one of the things we have tried to do is, is to look so we have a gradient across the Midwest, something I didn't talk about today. Um, so from Michigan samples to Kansas samples to Wisconsin to Iowa samples. And then to look at the spatial patterning with distance. Actually, much of the variation occurs at a very small scale in soil. Um, and as you go, one meter, it may be not a lot different than 100 meters or a kilometer. Though there is a pattern at a larger distance, but a lot of it is at a very small scale. Um, I don't know with regard to plant parts, maybe also at that scale, uh, but, scale but spatial scale is really important. And I think in general, I think most about the soil environment, it's more important than the temporal scale. So I just want to say in the data I did, it was the root microbiome as a whole. We took the whole root system, and so really that's an average over the whole thing. And I think that's a great point, that we need to be looking in tissues at more specifically what's going on. Um, with Arabidopsis, it's a challenge because of the material that you get out of it. Um, but I think um, some new visualization techniques are coming out that are going to make it possible to actually see these microbes at different locations and in different parts of different tissues. Um, but I, th I think it's a great follow-up set of experiments that needs to be done. In the case for my data, I, well, we try to represent the state with the five different fields per state, but some of them came from the producing region, so we were biased in that sense. We were looking for those fields that had the most uh, soybean production and also the most disease present. So we were just trying to bias our study to plant pathogens. Uh, but again, as Dr. Tiji said, 
I mean, spatial variation is really key. You saw it in the second part of my talk that the stronger signal comes from location. And I mean, it's really hard. I will say from the experience in population genetics of pathogens, so some of those um, political boundaries don't mean too, too much for pathogens. So <laughs> you are playing with all those different scales, but again, you can see those effects in some of these results. Well, I have to talk, because if they all talk, I'll have to do that too. I guess it's cost-driven too. Uh, it really depends on how much money you have and what you can do with that money. So that's, I think, the limiting factor number one. I like to, some, to look at all the plants, if I could, that would make my data set probably a lot better, uh, but I can't. So I, I had to really to, to pick um, you know, which plant I was going to focus on. But um, I mean, I, I show you the data, you know, like it wasn't, in the infected plants, we didn't uh, find the bacteria uh, all the time. I think it has to do, just like you say, with sampling design. And this can be improved as we move forward. Uh, but so, yeah, there's no right answer, I suppose. I'll just make a quick comment on that. So, yeah, all this large data that growers are beginning to collect, there's, um, there's going to be issues with data sharing, right? So that this is something, I guess, as a research community, when we're trying to collect agricultural data, that's going to be an issue, trying to work with Monsanto or Pioneer and get approval from the growers to obtain that sort of data. But we haven't gone out and actually contacted any companies or or grow us directly for that sort of data that in this in our study anyway. So, so basically the question or comment was, um, you know, can we um, basically come up with some sort of agreement with the growers, the farmers, to, to obtain some of that confidence, well, their information, I guess. I think it'd be really beneficial. Um, I, I don't know how we would tackle going about that, though. Yeah. yeah. I have some ideas. Great. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I really think it's important that you get, you get all the metadata that you can get so you can correlate um, a microbiome uh, profile with the environment. So, so it's, yes, it's important to know, like, when you do some field sampling, like I do, what is the growers using, what fertilizer is he using, what's the irrigation regime, and so on and so forth. So you can pile up that, and eventually you will be able, as we get more and more data, we'll be able to build up those correlation and show that maybe uh, these cultural practices influence those type of communities. So uh, we're not there yet, but actually with the uh, California Citrus Research Board, this is what we're trying to do with, with Wong Long Bing and get all the metadata that we, that we can uh, to make those correlation down the road eventually. So I have a comment about, about this because I think metadata is really important, but a balance between what one measures and what, analyze, what one analyzes. So, so I still have a problem with the 16S or 28S or ITS data because it's very coarse. You can have very fine metadata, but when you're comparing it to very coarse biological data, 
you, you don't really get to the level of information you need. Ideally, you want finer for both, but, but the balance between the two becomes important. told at a year, uh, workshop in Europe by, that involved ecologists of various scales that if you can't count absolutely everything, then you can't apply the principles of ecology. Exactly. I mean, in the case of a vector, I think it's relevant to see how those communities influence uh, vector behavior, for instance. If you look for a biocontrol, I think it's relevant to look maybe at phages, you know, uh, viruses and so on and so forth. So try to go at, at, at different levels. I, mean, I think it's relevant. But again, it's cost driven. It's, you know, what do you choose when you start your project? You have to start somewhere and you cannot do everything. So sampling is one thing, but then you cannot sequence all the organisms that are associated with one given plant. So I think uh, as cost goes down, we'll be able to do more. Uh, but, uh, but yes, I, I would totally agree with you. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point that I don't know that we have a platform where we can equally find everything's abundance and everything in a sample. So I think um, at this Nimbus workshop we were at at Tennessee a couple weeks ago, they talked about how from meta metagenomes now you can close viral genomes. So if you take a soil uh, metagenome, you might be able to find the bacteria and the viruses in the same sample using the same method. But I think that system is still notoriously bad for getting fungi out of it. And I don't know how it is with nematodes, so I don't know what the platform is that you can equally sample everything without. I, I just don't know what, if we have that platform yet.
I think that that is part of the different approaches that we are trying to take. I mean, you can start from trying to simplify the model, just look a few mutants and see how that affects the community. Then we have some people like us that are, are going straight to the field, try to parse out some of the information, but there is a lot of noise. And I guess all of us that are working in this field are dealing with that. The other approach is we can follow what ecology does. I mean, sometimes I say that I am trying to solve a pat plant pathology problem from the ecology persp perspective. And what I mentioned at the end of my talk is we can use those classical ecology setups, introduce one species, two species, like Dr. Kinkle is doing in the streptomyces uh, system, and try to parse out some of the important signals that, are, uh, that we need to understand, but also reduce the noise that we are getting from these systems. So, I mean, there are different approaches, and that is the exciting thing that we have now, because everybody's taking a different path to try to solve the same problem. And hopefully everything will converge and we can get some exciting answers. But yeah, I mean, we've faced different challenges. Going back to some of the issues, there is a lot of discussions about dead cells, live cells, dormancy. And that is really key for pathogens too. So when you have soil-borne pathogens, you have to understand that when you are sequencing DNA, you are sequencing everything. But there are new tools and I mean, Right now, microbiome or the sequencing of uh, our community is just another tool that we can use to understand what is happening. And we, can, we have to go back to the classics and also use other new tools like qPCR and trying to come together and uh, converge all these uh, different results into one hopefully nice answer to <laughs> solve these issues. That's a good, very good question because uh, this is the sequencing data is not the end in itself. We need to be able to use that. So how do we use that? When, and when we identify beneficial organisms, how can we use those beneficial organisms? So what I'm trying to do, I'm more interested in manipulating those organisms and uh, identify cultural practices, and it goes back to your field question, identify cultural practices that modify those organisms. So, you know, it, and it can be anything and try to correlate uh, any given cultural practices with the presence of uh, beneficial organisms. So, you know, again, we go back to the irrigation, fertilization, you name it. Uh, I think this is important because we have to go back to uh, the grower and the industry when we talk to them about uh, these types of science. Uh, and uh, I've also mentioned uh, grafting. I think grafting can be an interesting approach if you can show that you actually uh, can transmit a beneficial uh, microbial community to an infected plant and restore the health of the plant, then that can be a, a pra practical output uh, of interest. So things like that. But that, to me, that's what interests me is how you manipulate those organisms.
case of what we are working in the field crops, I mean, they are solar work pathogens, and there is not much that you can do when they are present in your field. But as I mentioned, we have different layers of information, and if we understand the community, we can tailor treatments, seed treatments, for example, to control varieties that are more resistant to certain groups of pathogens. That is another approach that we can use and get more, um, or give something valuable to the grower. Also, I mean, hopefully we come a long way, but we can use a few samples from a field and have a risk assessment for the grower. Tell the grower, okay, you have these and these and these different groups, and it's really risky if you plant this specific cultivar. So hopefully we will get there, but again, it's key to collect the data, have all the information available, so we can do that kind of analysis and provide those resources to the growers. So all good answers, but I think anything, when, when one is dealing at any time with interactions of communities, then it gets very complex. Uh, and that's the case on the human side also. Now there's a recommendation of about 45 um, good gut organisms that can improve your, I mean if you have uh, a dysbiosis in your intestinal tract, Maybe with 45 organisms you can do well, but maybe not in all people. Um, so it's the host is part of it also. But I think one of the things that, that might happen earlier, in complex situations like this, then um, to get a handle on key components of that complexity. Sarah gave some examples. I think the grafting is another example of how you can deal with understanding complex com components of communities. But in, an early part of that is I think from the omics we will have diagnostics. Not one organism or one gene, but maybe a suite of organisms of gene and genes. And with the medical side developing all kinds of rapid diagnostics for point of care, that can apply also to the field situation. So one might have di diagnosis that is more immediate. The second question is then what can you do about that? But, but having the, diagno uh, the diagnostics first, I think, is a, is a big help in complex situations. That's a problem, indeed. <laughs> so, well, I mean, I think you have to work with um, some kind of bioassay. Um, so you can't culture it, so you have to come up with some uh, plant bioassay where you can evaluate that. Uh, or you have to find a surrogate and some a closely related organism where you can test your hypothesis. Uh, so in, in our case, uh, the Liberibacter crescens is, is, the, is the closest related one. Um, but it's definitely a challenge to test hypotheses with, with organisms that you can culture. Um, so but we'll find a solution, don't worry. Stay calm. <laughs> <laughs> There were not all endophytes. I mean, there were pathogens in there as well. But I think they are, you were surprised because there was no information available. That's why. I mean, most of the research in that field is done on the rhizosphere, on the endosphere of the roots, and on the phylosphere. There's barely nothing available on the vascular system of plants. 
So it's really just this information, I think it's novel in itself because it's reporting what organisms are associated with uh, perennial plants and grapes in that case. So yeah, I, was, I didn't know what to expect either, um, but, and it's, what's surprising too, it's like uh, those tissue were um, lignified tissue, one-year-old tissue, so like at the beginning of the season, there was nothing. So like between the time they grow, which is uh, April, to the time we sample, which is September, they were colonized by that diversity of organisms. So uh, this is very interesting, I agree with you. Um, if you want the answer for another fight, you can open a good <laughs> pathology book and I'm sure you'll get the answer. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, um, for attending and, and participating in the discussion. And once again, let's thank all the speakers.